travel and seeking out adventure was like in my veins, right? And that's what I knew, that's what I wanted to do. I loved the freedom of being able to do it. It was that light bulb moment. I thought, right, this is what I have to do. And I just immediately saw this massive opportunity for me to disrupt this outdated and naff industry and create a really aspirational on-point brand. We see ourselves as a platform that connect people at the same life stage right and the travel the reason we have the travel is because travel creates friendship quicker than anything else today on the podcast we have Rada Vias who's the CEO and co-founder of Flashpack they started as a travel company all about connecting people in the 30s and 40s for unique experiences and they've since grown on to much more than that which you're going to learn about during the episode Rada's got a really interesting story because for a few years, she was trying really hard to come up with a new concept and build a business, but it wasn't working for her. Then she met a co-founder with an interesting story, which you're going to hear, and that then flourished. They were able to grow massively with Flashpack, but then COVID hit and everything came crumbling down. So off the back of COVID, she was then able to rebuild the company. It's now got investment from Jamjar Investments to really go on further. So Rada's story is one of incredible resilience and fighting through even when things look very bleak. So I'm really excited to share this episode with you. So, right, you've had such an amazing journey and had many ups and downs. But when you're growing up, do you ever think one day I'll be a founder, one day I'll be doing this kind of thing? Or what were your ambitions? I don't think I knew what an entrepreneur was. When I was growing up, it wasn't a thing. I didn't know anybody who wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was surrounded by people who were talking about business quite a bit. And my parents were definitely very enterprising people. I think I wasn't very conventional. So while the rest of my friends and families were doing, you know, university career path, although I did that, I was I was off traveling the world as well. While they were getting excited about law and medicine, I was living in France. I was studying um, at Madrid University. I lived in Chile. I was backpacking around South America. So travel and seeking out adventure was like in my veins, right? And that's what I knew. That's what I wanted to do. I loved the freedom of being able to do it. In tandem, my parents, like I said, were super enterprising. They always dreamed of setting up their own restaurants. They're amazing cooks. And they always had a side hustle, right? They had traditional jobs, but they always had a side hustle of a catering business and my sisters and I were always recruited to help you know make thousands of puris for the, like a wedding event or a charitable event and we would go and help serve and so they instilled that work ethic in us. I think the only indication I had that maybe there was some kind of business skills in me a teacher very early on mentioned to my parents that I had leadership skills I think maybe I was 12 or 13 I remember that feedback so maybe that was the only indication that it was kind of in my veins but other than that I didn't I didn't know anybody in my family who'd done it. So I don't think I had a clear plan in my head. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I definitely was dreaming up ideas. By the time I was at university, I was constantly thinking of business ideas, talking to my mum about business ideas. And she said to me, look, if you want to do it, do it before you have kids, because you'll be more willing to take risk. And if you're more willing to take risk, you'll be more successful. And so I always had that in my mind. And by when I left university, I was just trying lots of different things. I set up a blog. I, um, I created a business plan for a tea shop concept. It was a bit avant-garde really in terms of, it was a kind of new tropics brand, but it was a way ahead of its time. It was back in 2007. So now I think it would have done really well. It was called Teology, but yeah. it didn't It didn't get off the ground back then way too early. So I tried so many different things. And by doing that, I just trained my brain to find trends, to find mm. solutions to problems. And then when I stumbled upon this idea of group community travel, I was I was ready to take advantage of the opportunity. So it's interesting there, you remember that feedback you got as a 12-year-old? And I think that's one of the really important things as well, people listening, is that those kind of positive feedback and reinforcement you can get at the early age can really make a huge difference where a lot of people are so quick to pick up the negatives, right? And somebody could say, like, the leadership skills, right? It's like, what kind of format that, that was in? Somebody like, oh, they're taking charge, where they should be giving God. But it's showing that there's a positive aspect to these different elements as well. And that would then enable you to be able to think, oh, okay, I can do this because other people can see it in me too. And you mentioned there about some of the different ideas. Did you ever get disheartened when you thought like, okay, this tea company with the new tropics isn't going to work out? Or was it just exciting like that thrill you had of thinking more ideas afterwards? No, I was devastated. When the tea shop 
idea didn't work out, particularly because I put my heart and soul into writing a 70 page business plan. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Then when it didn't, and I'd spent a year researching, I went down the whole research rabbit hole, you know, I was standing outside coffee shops, like counting footfall the whole lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And when it didn't, when I felt like I couldn't make it work, it was devastating. I think I was just under my covers in bed for like a day or two trying to come to terms with it and figure out what I was going to do next. And I felt like my dream of business, of and I didn't know the word entrepreneur then, I don't think, but just owning a business, owning my own business as a route to freedom was kind of slipping away from me. And I, just facing the fact that I might have to go down the corporate career path was was horrifying, to be honest. It was, there was nothing I wanted less. And then obviously... So that didn't work out, but then what you've gone on to do afterwards has worked out. So it shows the idea is something sometimes people see one value and think that's it. And it's not often you can try the things, there's different opportunities available to you. You said you stumbled across the idea for group community travel. How did that come about? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, so I... I was in my early 30s and like I said, this kind of idea of like my big dream to have a scalable business was slipping. I felt like it was slipping away and I was feeling pretty like down and depressed and like most people just thought of, right, I need to escape. I need to go on holiday, right? When you're having troubles, rang a lot of my friends. Do you want to come with me? Let's go to Thailand, what have you. Everybody was busy, right? They were, some of my friends were having babies and getting married already. Some were kind of busy with their own lives. And a friend of mine said to me, oh, why don't you go on a group tour? And I said, group tour? What are you talking about? I remember feeling distinctly offended. <laughs> I just thought it was this naff concept for 18-year-old backpackers who had never travelled the world before or for retirees with matching caps, right? And I was this cool young woman who wanted adventure, who'd travelled the world. But the concept stuck with me. And I went to the British Library and um, I researched all the trends and I could see that they were all going in the right direction, right? Adventure travel was growing 65% year on year. The, the adventure tourism business was worth 265 billion globally like everything was going in the right direction and I just it was that light bulb moment I thought this is my life's work I've traveled my entire life it's what I know it's in my veins and people always used to say to me follow your passion but because I was multi-passionate I was passionate about food and different things I think I got lost down these avenues and when I found travel it was that light bulb moment I thought right this is what I have to do and I just immediately saw this massive opportunity for me to disrupt this outdated and NAF industry and create a really aspirational on-point brand. So I got very, very excited. And because I had tried and failed at so many things before, you know, for years before, I'd been trying for four or five years, I knew this was right. And I'd already built up the skills to take immediate advantage of this opportunity. Um, so that, so that's how it really happened. In tandem, I was thinking I should sort out my love life. I went on Match.com and the algorithms matched me to Lee, my now husband. And he ended up living down the road from me in Brixton, actually. Mm. And he was a photojournalist. We went to a bar and after a few glasses of wine, I mean, we were talking about business and travel the whole night. So we, you could tell we, we had a lot in common. And I told him my idea and he immediately got it because he was at the same life stage. He was in his 30s. He had just convinced two of his married friends to go to Thailand with him. And um, he said, look, I get this. I think this can be massive, you know. I would potentially like to do this with you. But we had just started dating. So we kind of spent our first dates. So it's so sad. But we spent <laughs> the first dates going to travel trade industry like shows and like investigating and researching the industry and researching the concept. And then we said, look, let's do a record to Sierra Leone together as you mm -hmm. do. And if we can survive Sierra Leone together, we could probably survive setting up a business together. And that's what we did. Yeah, that's pretty cool because <laughs> it's... A lot of people think about potentially starting a business with their partner and the different things involved, but that's often once it would have been going out for a while, right? So to do that right from the very first date, that's like incredible that it's worked out as well as a hatch, right? And I guess it must be one thing I know that a lot of people do as well. They're really protective of their idea, right? So at that stage, telling somebody you just met their idea, how did you feel about that? Were you kind of nervous? What were they still the idea or what if they tell other people? Or how did you feel? Were you quite open at that point after doing a few different ideas? to getting feedback early on. Because obviously, if he's been from the same kind of background of what he was interested in, he was a perfect kind of customer for you as well. 
It's a really interesting question. So I remember that distinct feeling in the early days when you're so scared to tell anyone your idea in case they steal it. And now I look back and I think, you know, it's, it's, you shouldn't really feel that way because so many people have ideas and very, very, very few people have the gumption and motivation and inclination and skills to actually go and execute on their idea. Like everyone has millions of ideas every day. Like who goes and actually executes on this stuff? I, I was scared. It did take a couple of glasses of wine for me to divulge it, but the night was going so well. And look, really, I'm a a gut instinct person. I'm like, I really follow my gut. I think my instincts are so strong. And I just had an instinct about Lee. And so I I went with it. And it's all it's all worked out really well. Because I I completely agree with you there, because I think so many people so protect for idea. But like I said, if you put it out there, then if somebody else can do it better than you, then maybe you weren't the best person to run the business in the first place, right? And obviously, the reason why it's been successful isn't just because you had the ideas, because you've been able to execute it so well. And once you did that trip to Sierra Leone, what were the actual first steps you did to start making it reality, like doing those first tours? Yeah, so when we initially set up Flashback, the idea was for it to be a super like cutting edge company. We would take you to places that you'd never thought about going before. So we, we when we launched the business, we launched with Sierra Leone, Chile, a Vespa tour in Spain and a, a horseback trip through Uganda. And... Mm very quickly realized, well, not so quickly, it took us six months to realize that nobody wanted to go there. Because if you hadn't been to Vietnam (laughs) or to just Thailand, you didn't really want to go to Sierra Leone. And so we had to pivot the business very, very quickly and start offering trips to countries that were a bit more mainstream, right? Until we'd Mm. built up like trust and credibility with our audience to take them to places that were quite far flung, like Sierra Leone. But initially, we it took us so long to get traction because we only had about £15,000 between us to invest in the business. And we were funding the business through our other businesses. So I had a fundraising business. Mm-hmm. Lee was a photojournalist. And we were a high, like a premium business. We had no social proof, no um, reviews, nothing, right? So to trying to convince our first customers to pay £2,000 with a company they'd never heard of to do a sort of type of travel that they'd never done before, like traveling with strangers was very, very difficult. So six months in, we were feeling pretty depressed that we had no traction. The phone rang once and it was a wrong number. And, um, you know, back in the day when we had actual (laughs) phones in our back bedroom, we went to Egypt on a holiday. Like I said, every time I'm feeling down, I think of holiday. So we went to Egypt because it was the cheapest holiday we could find. And we started having the dreaded discussion, like, shall we give up? And Lee and I just looked at each other and we said, look, we really think we've got a business here, but we had nothing but gut instinct to go on, right? We had no proof, but we just need to get more eyeballs on the business and we don't have money, right? And we can't raise money because we don't have any traction, catch 22 situation. What are we going to do? Lee one day was reading um, Mashable or something, I can't remember, and he saw a picture of Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio being fixed because of lightning damage. It was in 2014, just before the World Cup. And Brazil at the time was getting loads of bad press. You might remember they were pacifying the favelas and they were getting a lot of bad press around that. So Lee said to me, look, I've got this crazy idea. I'm going to fly to Rio and I'm going to convince the archdiocese to let me climb the Christ Redeemer and take a selfie from the top. And it's going to go viral and that's going to launch our business. And I didn't even know what viral meant at the time. But I said, look, okay, we've got nothing else. Last throw of the dice, go for it. We've got about a thousand pounds left. So he he did that. He flew to Brazil. He doorstepped the archdiocese. Two days later, the archdiocese turned up at the foot of the statue and said, you're crazy, but here are the keys. Go and do it. So he climbed Christ Redeemer popped his head out the top, took this amazing selfie. And then we sat on it for like a month because we were so scared that if BBC found out about it, they'd send Gary Lineker there and nobody would care about Lee Thompson. Um, (laughs) And then we released it to the press two weeks before uh, the World Cup. And we were capitalising on the selfie trend. You remember selfies were just going wild back in 2014 and the World Cup, obviously. And it went in Sane. I mean, we got 10 million hits to our website in about a week. Our website crashed. We Lee was going around doing TV interviews with everyone, right? Um, CNN, like, you know, everyone. I was emailing every photojournalist in the world saying, yes, you can have the picture for free, but please give us a backlink. And we got covered by the entire world media. And we started getting our monthly traction and we got off the ground. It's absolutely crazy, but that's how we did it. Because one of the things I guess I don't really mention myself anymore is like, so I've been to... It's 48 countries, because I know this because I was in Botswana on a group trip when the pandemic hit and our visa got cancelled, we had to leave. So I would have been on 50 because I would have gone to Zimbabwe and Zaire as well. Nice. But I understand the complete problem there as well from my perspective that when it was early in my 20s, I did a lot of solo travel, I did go to different places. 
But when you get to places which are a bit more difficult, say for me it was Botswana, I was like, I don't really want to wander around there by myself because I'm not comfortable with that. And that's where group travel really comes in. So there's like the definite like, key problem there. And, but I didn't, and then you thought about how you can tackle that. And that whole crisis of dreams thought is incredible because it's thinking outside the box, right? Because some people think they, they would Google like, okay, how do I do this? How do I do that? But that, that flash of, no pun intended, but the, the flash of the idea there, right? <laughs> of where doing something different like that, but now you've come back to the UK again and you're trying to deal with all of this demand. How did you do that? How did you cope? Because there's one thing to deal with when you haven't got any customers and that's like a certain level of stress. But it's also a stress of like, how are we going to fulfill this? How did you cope with that operational side? It was really hard. So we continued bootstrapping the business. Um, look, to be honest with you, we bootstrapped for too long. At that point, we should have raised money and we mm. didn't. We carried on bootstrapping the business. But at that point, we had cash flow because we had customers. We had some interns. We were all sitting in our back bedroom in our Brixton flat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, they would come to our house every day. I'd make them chai in the morning <laughs> and we would set to work. And we and then we were funding the business through our own cash flow. And we got to 2016. 16 like that and then we realized that this the business was going well and we you know to get to that next inflection point we're going to have to go in we're going to have to have full skin in the game so I went out and fundraised 250,000 pounds from some angel investors and we gave up our other businesses we folded our other businesses and we went in full time we were the first employees on the payroll so essentially we've been running Flashpack full time since 2016 before then it was very much a side hustle we were doing it in the evenings I mean we were working till midnight every single night right it was intense in 2016 um we just went in full time and that was the inflection point in our growth we made our first million in booking turnover that year then we went from 1 million to 4 million 4 million to 12.8 million then 12.8 million to 20 million in at the end of 2019 so in four short years we completely bootstrapped the business we raised no other funding and um it was a wild wild ride but really difficult bootstrapping yeah bootstrapping a venture growth business is something that not many people do and now I know why because <laughs> it's 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 really hard <laughs> <laughs> and like because obviously you mentioned your husband you're now husband and your co-founder how do you split your different roles like what's the side that you're really passionate about and like what's the side that he brings to it we have very different skill sets and from the beginning we have carved out our roles properly and we have essentially we have veto over our own areas of responsibility i'm ceo and he's cmo and we the way we work together and the c-suite now the way we work together in general is that we disagree and commit right on small things so if it, if there's a small strategic pivot or something and we we're disagreeing but the the owner of that area of the business is adamant this is the direction we should be taking we all commit behind that mm -hmm. person however for really really big strategic problems or issues we we don't do anything until we all agree and especially Lee and I like Lee and I mm -hmm. have to agree um, and I can talk a bit more about that when we go into the COVID story I suppose but um, that's how we work together yeah that's what I was going to follow on to there because obviously mm -hmm. you had a huge decision to make in COVID because you're growing as you said like very rapidly the turnover every year is increasing and it's part of that growing market. But then the, that market just came to a standstill very suddenly. And how, I guess it must have been, well, that initial news of this country starting to close their borders and stuff. Even I mean, It's funny because I remember initially I was meant to go to China in March 2020. Then they closed their borders. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll go to South Africa and mm. Botswana because COVID is never going to get there, right? Mm. And obviously it did get there and I had to like try to escape. But how was that journey of like the stepping stones of, things starting to happen. Did you think this could be a global pandemic or how did you plan for that? Yeah. So in 2019, I had just had a baby. I'd came back to work and we we were being inundated by unsolicited emails from VCs saying we would like to back your business. Somehow our name had just got out there. I don't really know how. Mm. And um, I think because there aren't many businesses who can bootstrap to 20 million within four years. So everybody wanted to be a part of it, right? I was getting baby gifts in the post from Excel, mm. from Index. I could get into a room with a partner from pretty much any VC we wanted. So I came back to work and we started fundraising at, we prepared in December and in January, we went out and did all our teaser meetings, like a roadshow. We were getting, we had four offers from UK VCs and then we had American VCs saying, we'd like to back you. We had a Delaware company, so they wanted to back us. We're going to come over to 
you know, we're going to come over to UK. This was in kind of beginning of February. We're going to come over to the UK to meet you. We're not taking COVID seriously, but, you know, the firm has put a travel restriction on for a week. Nobody was taking COVID seriously. Lee was pretty much the only person panicking, actually, um, because from his photojournalism days, he knew that when something's in the press that much, it's big. And, um, but, you know, even when it was in Italy... I still think we, I still think over here, we just thought, ha ha, it's an Italian thing now. We didn't, you know, we were, we just had our head in the clouds. We started seeing for the first time in four years, we started seeing our growth flatline in January. January is normally like a step change in our business Um, for wellness and travel. It's a big month, right? And our growth flatlined year on year, flatlined for the first time. We didn't know what was going on. We did this big deep dive in the company. And then we realized that nobody was booking Asia, right? So even though China had shut down, nobody was booking Japan, Sri Lanka, and it was the biggest part of our portfolio, right? We had 78% drop um, in bookings for Asia. So we, then we realized in Jan, like, okay, this is big. Let's get this fundraise done. We were raising 10 million at that point. We had four offers on the table, just about to go into the DD at the beginning of March. And that's when we knew we were all going to have to go home, right? And on Friday, 13th of March, Trump closed the borders and everybody followed suit. And that was that was the beginning of the end. And it was absolute chaos. Phones were ringing off the hook. Customers needing repatriating. We had customers stuck in Morocco, stuck in Costa Rica, stuck in Sri Lanka. And we had thousands of customers asking us for refunds. I mean, it was absolute chaos. We didn't have any funders to turn to at that point. You can imagine all the funding fell through, right? Nobody wanted to be a part of travel at that point. It was one of the worst industries to be in. And um, we were just out there on our own for months trying to survive. We fell through all the schemes. I mean, there weren't many, right? I don't know if you remember, there was Future Fund, Mm -hmm. which was government match funding if your VC, you know, bailed you out, but we didn't have any VCs. And there was the C bills and we weren't profitable. So we had no one, we had no one to turn to. So we carried on talking to a few VCs who were, who kind of sensed the deal, right? I had to like climb down from massive 55 million valuation we were getting at the time, climb down pretty significantly. In tandem, we ran like a fireside, like fire sale, just try and sell the company. But everyone in travel were managing their own losses. So nobody was in a position to buy the company. And then after it was seven, eight months, Well, August, I think if you remember, God, it's taking me back now. In August, we were promised a vaccine by August. Do you remember that? Boris was saying we're going to get a vaccine. So we just thought, right, let's mothball the company until August and then everything will be fine. As soon as we can start running trips again, everything will be fine. So everybody went on furlough. I think by July, August, I think we realised that a vaccine's not coming for ages. And that's when we started talking about, okay, we need to start thinking about the next step now. We need to think of our director's duties and we we are trading insolvently here and we started talking about putting the business into administration which we then did in actually on Diwali day um mm. November 2020 which was which was really 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 difficult yeah because it's it's one of those things which people especially when you consider like how excited that the change in emotion here right how excited you are right at the very beginning about you knew this was your passion and then having the other high of where you got featured all across the world and to see that revenue growing and growing, this kind of joy that would be coming out of that, to then have that crushing low of what do we do now, right? And obviously you've been able to pick yourself back up from there again. But I like, talk us through that time, like how did you deal with that level of pressure and stress? Was there anything that was an escape or some way of to help you deal with it? If somebody listening right now maybe has to go through something similar in their business in the future, what advice would you give them? God, it was so brutal. It gives me like PTSD going back there, to be honest. It was it was so crazy. I cried a lot and I'm not ashamed to admit that. I did cry a lot. It really hit me hard. Like having to make 60 people redundant over Zoom, um, you know, it was such a scary time and there wasn't much escape. Like you remember, like we weren't, we were only yeah. allowed out for an hour a day. It was insane. We had to take our daughter out of nursery. We couldn't afford to keep her in nursery anymore. So we had a one-year-old running around the flat while we're trying to do VC meetings every single day, trying to save the business. I drank a lot. Honestly, mm-hmm. I drank a lot. I ate a lot. Um, my mental health was in the bin. The only thing that came, kept me sane was we would go for like that hour a day when we had time to walk we would walk and we would walk fast right we would just walk around Brockwell Park and we would just do laps right just try and get take the sun in like try and it was amazing summer that year so we just try and take the sun in like get some dopamine and we would just talk we'd talk to our friends and family it was brutal on them because they went on this journey with us 
and your friends and family often do. And I think we don't realize that as certain entrepreneurs that you're taking your closest, your nearest and dearest are kind of living this with you, but they have no control over it. So it's so hard on them. But I did, I did use my friends and family and I did talk a lot and I cried a lot and I just took every day as it came. The other thing I would say, my big piece of advice for any founders going through crisis is find impartial and that's really important impartial advisors that have no vested interest in your business so I had quite a few advisors that were sensing a deal that were sensing an opportunity and I just didn't know who to trust right we were Mm -hmm. going through this massive crisis I had a couple of people a friend who I'm going to shout out Neil Ambler he's a founder of Banked he's been a friend of mine for a really long time he was incredible and he he was a source of support and amazing advice and he had no other interest in in me or my business than he was a friend and he's an entrepreneur and knew what he was talking about right so um that's cr- absolutely crucial but going kind of just going back to that going back to that time you know i think we were flying high and i naively thought at that time that nothing nothing would stop us we were unstoppable i think i remember having a conversation with lee around that effect like naively just two months before covid hit and we only protected our upside like we were on founder salaries right we hardly paid ourselves anything i mean i was paying my nanny on a credit card it was ridiculous i only ever thought about upside exit never protected our downside never even put money into a pension properly you know so when the business failed we had nothing. Our entire net worth was in the business. I didn't even have a pension to show for it. So that would be my one piece of advice is protect your downside. Don't be naive. Obviously, you've got to be an internal optimist to be an entrepreneur. Otherwise, you'd never do this because it's so crazy. But you've also got to realize that everyone, every single entrepreneur goes through massive ups and downs. I mean, all the greatest companies are on the brink of collapse at least three times. So I'm, I'm laughing to myself there because I've stopped paying my pension at the moment. So I'll start doing that again. That's a good point. Um, so obviously now, like you're in a different position. We just had the announcement with Jamjar Investments and everything looks like it's looking on the up again. How's that journey been of going from where you were to like now you are where you are today? Like you almost had to have a fresh slate in some ways. And what changes did you make to now future-proof the business and to have the future more bright. So we put the business into administration, Diwali in November 2020. And um, that was hard, but we had, you know, we had thought about it for a long time. The hardest thing was that Lee decided that as CMO, he said, we have to be fully transparent about putting the business into administration, right, with our community. We have to own the narrative. And he, it took me, I have to admit, it took him weeks to convince me. I was so scared. I said, look, Lee, look, we are not a household brand. Like, we are a big brand amongst 30s and 40s solo travellers, right? But not everyone in the UK or US knows us. We can fly under the radar. No one's really going to notice. There's a lot of noise around COVID. Like, no one's going to realise. Let's just go quietly. And he said, no, we've got to, we've got to own this. We've always been a transparent company. We've We've got to own this. And um, and I said, okay, and this is what I'm going back to, like disagree and commit, but mm-hmm. except for really big decisions, right? So he had to get me on side to be able to execute on that strategy. He did get me on side because I, I trust him. And even though I was so scared, we did it. And we put it out on all our socials um, and email out to our entire database of customers. And you know, it went public. It went in all the trade press. Flashpack has failed. And um, it was terrifying but actually what came out of the darkness was this incredible support from our community of customers who came out and said we are devastated you have impacted our lives positively we'll never forget that we hope you're back we're incredibly sorry and that source of support and energy there were some negative comments as well right but that source of energy gave us a lot of hope and so what did you then do so what's the rebirth of flashback yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. So uh, basically, we um, in the administration process, the administrators said to us, you can bid on the assets, the assets are going up for sale, you can bid on the assets as founders. And we said, yes, we are going to do that immediately, because we had nothing left, right? We had no personal runway, we're on the brink of personal bankruptcy. We look, could we have even gone out there and got other jobs? The entire industry was decimated. Could I even work for anyone? Like I hadn't worked for anyone for years. I mean, it's Life outside of Flashpack felt very bleak. Like it was our baby. 
you know. So we just said, right, we're going to do it. One last throw of the dice. What have we got to lose, right? So we um, had equity in our house. We remortgaged our house. We borrowed money from friends and family. And we just scrambled around. We found as much money as we could and we bid on the assets. And then we had to wait for a, a few weeks to find out if we'd kind of won the bidding process. And of course, we weren't allowed out right? Because we were only allowed out an hour a day back then. So we painted our hallway for two weeks to try and just keep sane and pass time. And then after that process, we found out that we were the highest bidders of three bidders and we'd got the business back, which was incredible feeling. But also, like, I remember just feeling this dread. I was like, godly, we're back. We're back at the bottom of the mountain. We're in the same flat in Brixton. And it's me and you again with no money, no staff, nothing. Right. I, it was just it was it was absolutely crazy. Then Lee and I just said, right, our daughter was still out of nursery. We said, right, let's divide and conquer. Lee, you go and save the brand. I'll go and find us a funder. Right. As audacious as it sounded, um, it was, you know, we were approaching 2021. So hmm. we were like, OK, we might find some funding. It's like crazy, crazy, crazy raising market out there right now. And that's what we did. Went and found a 50 billion pound fund to back our vision for community travel. They're called PPF. They'd completely got it and they funded us out of bankruptcy. And Lee spent every single day for about a year helping customers through a very complex refund process to make sure nobody lost out. Right. And um, anybody who did lost, there were some customers who couldn't get their money back and we made good in the new company. We made sure none of our suppliers lost out. So suppliers who lost money in the administration process with us, we said, look, stick with us. We'll give you more business than, you know, than the loss that you made in Flashpack 1.0. And 98% of our suppliers still came with us. And we're really proud of that. It's because we didn't bury our head in the sand. And I think that would be another piece of advice. If you're going through crisis, do not hide. Don't hide. Face it. We got on calls, video calls with all of our suppliers saying, we are going into administration. We are really sorry. We know you're going to lose money with us but have keep faith we'll make it up to you some way if it's not this business it'll be another business and they did and they came back and now they're making more money with us than they ever did you know if they were running kind of japan for us now they're now running japan vietnam and and thailand and, and that's how we made good and we hired back some of our old team as well so we're really really proud of that journey it was it, it has been really hard we relaunched again in November 2021. So Diwali, November 2021. And Diwali is becoming a bit of a kind of milestone for me now. We relaunched and it has been a wild ride again. So what we achieved in four years, we've now achieved in two years. We're exceeding where we were um, pre-COVID. We are, we've got a team of 75 here in the UK, USA, Melbourne. I mean, we're a fully remote team. So we've got staff in 11 countries around the world, but um, the main teams are UK and USA. And we're scaling really quickly again. And we've just raised another round of 5 million with Jamjar as a lead investors and with the purpose of scaling in the US and scaling our tech. And it's we're doing it all again. And it feels it feels really good. It feels better, actually, this time round because we feel like we actually know what we're doing this time. And we, we consider ourselves second time founders. We feel like the journey is not as, the oscillations aren't as intense, you know, they're a bit more, you know, there's, it's, they're not, the highs and lows aren't so high and low. Like we're kind of maybe kind of existing in a, in a happy medium between those mm. peaks and troughs. Feels great. That's amazing to hear. What's the future? What, what are we looking towards now? What, you've just got the investment through. What's your ambition? What's the dream for where Flashback's going to go to? We've got really, really big dreams for Flashback. So we don't consider ourselves a travel company, which might be kind of weird to hear. We see ourselves as a platform that connect people at the same life stage, right? And the travel, the reason we have the travel is because travel creates friendship quicker than anything else, right? And creates deeper and more meaningful friendship than anything else. Like if we met today, I said, right, we could really get on. We're on the same wavelength. It would take us something like, there's studies out there, something like 200 hours to create friendship, right? If you think about that, that's probably over the course of a year, that's an intense investment of going out for dinners. And, and so friendship accelerates all of that really quickly, which is why we have the travel company. But we're actually a friendship company. What we really care about is is reducing isolation, is creating friendship, creating connection and solving one of the biggest societal issues we have of our time right now, uh, which is loneliness. So that that's our ambition is to become the friendship company. US is our biggest market, it's our biggest opportunity. And Lee and I are moving out there next year. We've just come back from a recce and we are really focused on just scaling as quickly as possible before the next recession comes along. <laughs> That's amazing. So really exciting to hear what you've been up to there. We're going to have to move on to quick five questions now just because of time. But the first one, 
who are three British Asians that you'd love to spotlight they think are doing incredible work? Yeah, first one, Puna Bell. She's an incredible author, um, entrepreneur, just a badass woman who inspires me every single day. I follow her content religiously on Instagram, like you have to follow her. She's amazing. She's got so much to give. My second entrepreneur, nobody will really know him because he's quite under the radar, but Rajiv Nayar, he's a founder of Fixed Flow, recently exited. We actually shared an office together back in 2016 or something, 15. And he's an incredible entrepreneur. He has executed his business seamlessly to exit. He's incredible. And I, I, I've always looked at him for inspiration and um as a source of kind of advice as well. And my third one is Rajib Day, a co-founder of Learnably. I've been following him. He won't know this. So if you're you're listening to this, um, I've been following him since his um, internship days, like when he set up that business back in, I don't know, it was 2005 or something, right? It was was like one of the first entrepreneurs that I really started following when I started my journey. He's an incredible entrepreneur and with a lot of heart and soul. And I really admire him. Perfect. So next question is... If people listening right now want to learn more about you, learn more about Flashpack, where should they go? Flashpack.com. You can find out all about the amazing trips we have got going on. You can attend our events. We've got a house party event in Hoxton in um, on the 25th of November. You can attend our LA or New York. We've got lots of events going on that you can just come and attend and meet people at your, at your life stage in your 30s and 40s and make friends. Um, and if you want a bigger adventure, then you can go to Flashpack.com. And if people listening right now could help you in any way or help Flashpack, what do you need help with? I always, I'm so grateful for user feedback. So if you've been on a trip and you've got some feedback, get in touch. And if you haven't been on a trip and you have feedback about our user experience, our website, our app, anything, please do get in touch. Perfect. So really enjoy this conversation and I could talk for a lot longer, but we've run out of time. Have you got any final words for the audience? My final words would be, well, to quote Seneca, right? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So just get out there. Don't wait for inspiration, your big idea to fall on your lap. Go out there, test lots of different things, train your mind to find trends, to find opportunities, to solve problems. And then when your big idea does come along, you'll be ready to take advantage of it. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for listening. It means a huge amount to us. And we don't think you realise how important you are. Because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you leave us a five-star review, it makes a world of difference. And if you believe in what we're trying to do here, to inspire, connect and guide the next generation of British Asians, if you do those things, you can help us achieve that mission. And you can help us make a bigger impact. And by doing that, it means we can get bigger guests, we can host more events, we can do more for the community. So you can play a huge part. So thank you so much for supporting us.